This week, I just really felt there was something that God laid on my heart to, to bring to us. So I want to begin by reading from uh, Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 6, some very famous verses from uh, Isaiah chapter 6, starting at verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook. And the temple was filled with smoke. <clears throat> Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. My eyes have seen the King, the Lord of glory, Lord Almighty. And one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he'd taken with tongs from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin is atoned for. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the power and authority of it. We thank you for the deep truth that is revealed within it. We pray today, as we look at this great uh, story and the life of Isaiah, as we lift our eyes <clears throat> to the vision that you've placed before us, Holy Spirit, speak to us. Soften us where we're hard, equip us where we're weak, lead us forward. In Jesus' glorious name we ask, amen, amen. So right at the, the start of the church, some 14 years ago now, um, uh, the anniversary is coming up again, I think in October, Paul Rass, who was uh, very much the founding father of the church here, and who, by the way, is speaking in Knighton uh, today. He's been invited over there to speak. But Paul and some others um, were really just praying and reflecting and looking at what, what was the underlying statement that would sit in the foundation, if you like, of the life of the church as a, as a tagline, a, a focus for vision. It's always been on uh, our posters. Uh, it's been on leaflets. It's on the website. But the reality is it's one of those things that can easily just, you sort of, it's been there for so long, you forget it. You forget that it's there uh, and forget what, what those phrases are. Can anybody remember, anybody know those three, three little sentences? <laughs> Restoring lives, reviving hope, reaching communities. That's it. I thought somebody's going to turn around and have a look and see. <laughs> Restoring lives, reviving hope. Reaching communities. Thank you to Glenn as he, hopefully, uh, my PowerPoint, he can prod it in the right places. Such a good set of words. I've always valued them since I, I first saw them. When I first received a phone call about the possibility of exploring uh, links and relationship with this church, like a good modern uh, non-millennial, but uh, I, first thing I did, looked at the website. <laughs> and uh, I remember seeing Mike and Jill's smiling face on the website and uh, started to pray for them immediately. <laughs> no, I did, it's true. But I remember what caught my eye, 2016, uh, whatever, whenever it was in 2016, restoring lives, reviving hope, reaching communities. Now, of course, at one level, that's all they are. They're just a, a set of words. They could be used by quite a number of other organizations, particularly maybe organizations that are working with people uh, in the care industry. You could, you could have that as your tagline, restoring lives, reviving hope, rich in communities. And so words like that need to be set in context. And of course, the context is here. It's here. It's the family of the Apex Church. Joyce, it's wonderful the way you spoke of family 
uh, and being family. And uh, families have strengths and they have weaknesses. We have to keep working at that. But the context of restoring lives, reviving hope, reaching communities is in the context of church. And so what we can add to it, if you like, is in and through and because of the Lord Jesus Christ. And by and in and through the power of the Holy Spirit. These are not words that are just floating on their own. They could be used by a humanitarian organization. But no, restoring lives, reviving hope, reaching communities in and through and because of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the power of his spirit. They're not floating on their own. They're set in context. They're they're words that are set in context. They actually could be summed up in two words, which are not on the PowerPoint, because I got up quite early this morning just really working through uh, these thoughts again. And I thought, of course, this thread that uh, um, Ashley's really been exhorting us to and has been calling us to, they can be summed up in two words, making disciples. Making disciples. And that's our, that's our heart, that's what we're about. It's exciting. Uh, two of our, our groups now have got names. So we've got Cornerstone Group, uh, that often meet at uh, Mike and Jill's house. And we've got Living Stones Group. There's a theme already, thread there, and which uh, Malcolm and his wife Dawn, I'm so thrilled to hear Dawn's been coming along, Malcolm. It's wonderful. Um, often at the moment meeting at Dave and Sandra's house. And I think the heart is for other groups Um, to really begin to grow and develop. Making disciples. How do we disciple one another? Groups are not new. Um, We've had them for years, but an emphasis. We're finding ourselves coming back to discipleship. So um, I know some of you want to talk with Ashley about that. Please talk to him. We want to see month after month, group after group, growing, making disciples. What on earth does this have to do with Isaiah chapter 6? Somebody might be saying. Well, I've been praying. I knew that this was what I wanted to speak on today for the last two or three weeks. And I've been praying and reflecting how we might revisit these statements. And on Wednesday, Pat Anderson and myself were up in London. Um, we are both trustees of Regions Beyond that we've already mentioned, this family of churches across the world and particularly regions beyond UK as a charity and we were invited to go and meet with the UK team. There's a a group of leaders that helped to give us a focus and, and, and oversee where we're heading and we were invited to go and meet with them, to pray with them and worship with them as trustees. So it was a it was a really good time. And during the worship I felt the Holy Spirit remind me of these verses from Isaiah Uh, chapter 6. And so I I shared them. And then someone else picked up the theme of Isaiah chapter 6. And uh, as we were praying and worshipping, I just found my mind also thinking about today and about these three statements. And I suddenly began to realize these things are connected together. They're related together in a number of ways. But I also was conscious, and this is where I want to start really with these reflections of these verses, of our current context, obviously of the last last 10 days, with the the death of Queen Elizabeth, the state funeral tomorrow, where people are at in our community, in our nation, indeed in our world. And I want to highlight as we start with these first 11 words, first 11 words. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. The death of the king was clearly significant enough that it's recorded as the context for what then happened. What happened next and and the ongoing chapters of Isaiah that you can read, an amazing, amazing book. The death of the king creates, it's recorded as it were by Isaiah or by the writer of Isaiah, in the year the king died, something happened. I saw the Lord. Question to you, question to you. What will be written in your diary, in your journal, your memoirs for the the coming year? 
I don't know if any of you write memoirs. <laughs> um, some of us are journalists. Some of us will note things in the diary on the calendar. What will you write? In the year Queen Elizabeth died, I. I what? You what? In the year that Queen Elizabeth... Some of us have memories of things that happened, don't we? We can think back. We remember 9-11... Some of you will remember where you were, 9-11, when you first heard the news about or saw those towers coming down. Diana's death. Some of you will remember that. Who told you? Some of you are old enough to remember JFK being shot. People often say, I know where I was. In fact, you're already turning to each other and saying. In the year Queen Elizabeth died, I... It's interesting, and it's another significant September date. But as we go through these days, and as we go beyond, as individuals and a nation, my biggest prayer is this, that we might say, in the year Queen Elizabeth died, I saw the Lord. We saw the Lord. I don't know what's going through the minds and the hearts of the dear people Hour after hour after hour as they go, the sensation that they talk about, what they feel in the room, all of those things. But my prayer, my prayer for each one of us is that we might say, as I looked at those images, as I look again tomorrow, as I watch and as I listen on the television, whatever it might be, that we might say, I saw the Lord. In the midst of challenge, in the midst of uncertainty, of long-held anchors being pulled up, stability shaken, where do we look? Where do we look? When the email comes, when the phone call comes, when the whatever it might be, where do we look? To use the words of Isaiah 55, in fact, let me, let me read to you great parts of Isaiah 55. I want to urge you to seek the Lord. Call on him while he is near. I believe these, we're living in days where the Lord is near. The Lord is near. He's always near. But there are, there are moments, there are seasons, there are times in nations where the Lord comes near. And I believe this is a day and a time. Isaiah 55, verse 6, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Listen to this. Let the wicked forsake his ways, the evil man his thoughts. Let him turn to the Lord, and he will have mercy on him to our God, for he will freely pardon. I mean, the whole of Isaiah 55 is an incredible chapter. Many of you know it off by heart. It starts with, Come, or you are thirsty. Come to the waters. Come who have no money and come by any... I mustn't start preaching on Isaiah 55. But look at Isaiah 55. Maybe read it tomorrow as part of whatever you're doing during the day. Look at it. It's an invitation. It's an invitation. I saw the Lord. I saw the Lord. I'm looking at the one who is the king over all kings. And queens. She herself said that of him. I saw the Lord. I'm looking at the Prince of Peace. The great I am. The rock who is higher than all. The one who is unchanging, immovable, everlasting from everlasting. The same yesterday, today and forever. I saw the Lord. I saw the Lord. Oh, that we would say, in the year Queen Elizabeth died, I saw the Lord. That my heart was stirred, my attitude, my focus, my attention. It shook me, it stirred me. An anchor was pulled away, but I saw the Lord. When we talk about this vision, if you like, or these, these, this tagline undergirding uh, much of the life of our church, restoring lives, reviving hope, reaching communities, this must be our starting place. Must be our starting place. The Lord of glory. 
Wonderful in that worship, thanks to the guys who are leading us this morning. But just that sense of hearts being lifted, truth being declared. Didn't you feel your spirit? I did. And my heart was just soaring. And I, at one point I said, somebody pray. <laughs> somebody read a scripture. You may have heard me. I saw Ashley with his Bible. I said, Ashley, go on. <laughs> But I just want to say that as a body, I think there's more that God's got for us as a people. I've gone off peace, Mike. Mike always prays I go off peace. But uh, um, I, I just believe that in these days, more of us need to start shouting out glory to God. More of us need to be praying. More of us need to be reading scripture. Do you know you have permission? I'm not sure that you do. Do you know you have permission? Hey. Huh? Permission to speak out from there or from there, yeah. Because this can be terrifying. I do realize that, yeah. But that's our starting place. As the people of God, this is the basis for who we are. We've seen the Lord. We were dead. We were in darkness, but we've seen the Lord. The Spirit, the joy, the peace, the strength that we carry is because we've been given a revelation. We've seen something. More than that, we've been given something. God's love, Romans 5, has been poured out into our hearts. God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. We've been given the Holy Spirit. We've been given the love of God. It's been poured out into us. We've seen something. We've received something. Our lives have been flooded by a dynamic encounter with the living God. So as we just take these verses, I'm just going to work, work through these verses. Goodness, look at the time. Uh, work through these verses. I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Such a glorious, magnificent picture. I don't know if you ever dwell on those kinds of verses. You imagine what Isaiah saw, high and exalted, seated on a throne. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Imagine how much ermine and fur and goodness knows what else would have been involved in that, in that picture. Magnificent, glorious picture. We've seen, I'm sure all of you, even if you're not a big fan of watching lots of things on the news, God bless the BBC and the way it's been the last 10 days, how it's managed to fill <laughs> its programming. But we've seen some thrones, seen some thrones, haven't we? Great pomp and ceremony. I, I find it fascinating. I was brought up in a very royal home and I've been thinking about my mum a lot this week because she used to drag me kicking and screaming, not particularly, I wasn't allowed to kick and scream, but she used to drag us uh, in pouring rain to stand in all sorts of streets near Winchester and Windsor and uh, up in London to see the Queen because there was something about it. But I was always fascinated by marching bands. Does anybody else love marching bands? There's something about marching bands. And I, I, the documentaries, the, the immaculateness of those soldiers is just astonishing. But we've seen some stuff, haven't we? <laughs> just the pomp and ceremony. And there's more to come tomorrow. There's a, there's a sight tomorrow that will probably never be seen. Kings and queens, presidents and prime ministers gathering from all over the world. And there, in the middle of it all, is that crown. Seen this crown? The imperial state crown. Made of gold, set with 2,868 diamonds. 17 sapphires, 11 emeralds, 269 pearls, and 4 rubies. Contains some of the crown jewel's most iconic pieces. St. Edward's sapphire in the centre of the topmost cross, said to be worn in a ring of Edward the Confessor, discovered in his tomb in 1163. The Black Prince's ruby, which if you saw the documentary, the Queen said she always really liked given to Edward, Prince of Wales, in 1367, weighs 170 carats. It's one of the oldest uh, known gems in the world and parts of the crown, for sure. The Stuart Sapphire, 104 carats, believed to have originated from Asia, maybe present-day Afghanistan, Sri Lanka, Mayanmar or Kashmir. 
And of course, Pride of Place is the Kalean 2 diamond, 317.4 carats, which is part of the biggest diamond in the world. The four pearls hanging in the center of the crown are actual earrings are believed to possibly have been owned by Mary, Queen of Scots in the 1500s. When you ask the question, how much is it worth? Nobody knows. Nobody knows. The crown jewels have never been insured. They've never been appraised. Because they're simply thought of as priceless. And yet, all of this does not compare to the glory, the majesty, the splendor of the King of kings and the Lord of lords. I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne. The train of his robe filled the temple. Above him was seraphim with six wings. Two wings, they covered their faces. Two, they covered their feet. Two, they were flying. They were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is filled with his glory. This is not a piece of glory. This is not an item of glory. The glory of the world, however grand, pales into insignificance in the light of the glory of God Almighty. The whole earth is filled with His glory. Let's ask a question again. How often do we live with a shrunk down, dampened down vision of our gods. Boxed up, put on a shelf, marked Sunday or ICE in case of emergency. I saw the Lord Sunday in case of emergency. Brothers and sisters, I believe in these days we need a fresh revelation of the glory of God. Of the Spirit of God that is within us. As we seek, as a church, to go steadily forward, longing, praying, planning, hoping that lives will be restored, hope will be revived... Broken, wounded, hurting communities reached. What are we displaying? What do we carry with us? Is it just a pat on the back? Is it just a a sandwich? What are we displaying? People are looking for security. They're looking for faithfulness. They're looking for trustworthiness. They're looking for hope. What are we inviting them to see? Brothers and sisters, let's keep making room for welcoming and receiving the glory of God in every way that we can. Let's not shrink him down to size. Let's not package him up. I want to encourage you as you look at some of those pictures tomorrow, as you reflect, as you see all of that sort of pomp and ceremony, nothing compares to the glory of God that you carry in your heart that you carry into your workplace, that you carry as you stand at the school gate. The glory of God. And they, the seraphim, were calling to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of His glory. At the sound of their voices and doorposts, the threshold shook and the temples were filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried. I'm ruined. This encounter with the glory and the holiness of God is is a power encounter. It's a recognition. I'm, I'm ruined. I'm a man of unclean lips. I live among a people of unclean lips. My eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he'd taken with tongs from the altar, with which he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. 
restoration of life, revival of hope, begins in recognizing and acknowledging our state before a holy God. Recognizing and acknowledging our state before a holy God. Lives are broken. Hope is lost. Where does it begin? Oh, I've come to the end of myself. Woe is me. I'm a lost. I'm broken. I cannot stand in this glory and this holiness. How can I possibly even look at it? How can I even engage with it? Recognizing and acknowledging our state. I'm ruined. I'm a man of unclean lips. I live among a people of unclean lips. I've seen something. I've seen something. Clear declaration there, isn't there? Acknowledging the state of his heart. And words that have flowed clearly, words have flown, flowed from his heart. Jesus said, for the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. It's the words of Jesus. The mouth speaks what the heart is full of. And Isaiah is provoked, he's challenged, he recognizes that his mouth has been speaking out of a wrong heart, out of a, of a broken heart, a sinful heart. And he lives among a people who are the same. But he doesn't point, first of all, to others. He doesn't say, oh, look at them. He knows his own position. He acknowledges his own situation. The mouth speaks what the heart is full of. This is why we need to keep coming to God. We need to be being filled with the Holy Spirit, reading his word, worshipping, coming together, meeting with one another so that our hearts would be full of him. It's an interesting link with what happens next with the coal. See, not everyone recognizes where they're at. People can feel, many are feeling a pain at the moment. They're feeling an emptiness. They're feeling something that's been lost. But they don't always acknowledge where that can be met, where that can be filled, where that can be restored. But what happens in times of shaking and uncertainty, and in Isaiah's vision, everything shook. The whole building shook. But one of the things that happens, and I think we need to be ready in our day and in our time, eyes get opened. Hearts get softened. Questions begin to be asked. Honesty and reality get spoken out. And that's when we need to be ready. We need to be ready We need to be able to respond, to bring a message of good news that lives can be restored, hope can be revived. Sin, rebellion against God can be forgiven. How? God has made a way. God has made a way. One of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand. I want to say this, it's important again for us, and I believe particularly in our generation and our society in terms of the whole thing of self, self self-rule, self-contain, self-promotion, the whole thing of self, the initiative is always from heaven. The initiative is always from heaven. I want to say it so clearly, we cannot save ourselves. We can try, But whatever we try, it fails. We can put our hope in the the next new prime minister. We can put our hope in the, the next king. We can put our hope in education or whatever it might be. But the initiative ultimately always comes from heaven, from our creator and our maker. John 3, so famous. God so loved the world that he gave. He gave. His one and only Son. That whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. The initiative is always from heaven. There is a possibility of life restored, hope revived, but the initiative is always God's. Alec Matea, in his great commentary on Isaiah, says this. 
The live coal that was brought to Isaiah was from the fire of the altar. The place where the holy God accepted and was satisfied by blood sacrifices, where the animals would have been sacrificed. This one picture holds together the ideas of atonement, propitiation, and satisfaction required by God and the forgiveness, cleansing, and reconciliation needed by his people. All in one picture. All this is encapsulated in the single symbol of the live coal that's been taken from the place of sacrifice. And it touches his lips at that place of confession. Woe to me, I'm a sinful man. And instantly, it's announced that his guilt is taken away. His sin has been atoned for. I'm so looking forward in a few weeks' time when we we get this baptistry or we're down at the beach. One of the things we'll say to people, do you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord? Yes, I do. Do you believe in your heart God raised him from the dead? Yes, I do. Then on your confession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, we gladly baptise you. Woe to me. I'm a sinful man. A recognition. And the response comes from heaven. From that place of atonement. That place of sacrifice. That place of forgiveness. Comes and touches that confession. And forgiveness flows. Pointing forward to the day when the last and final great sacrifice is Jesus hung on the cross. Confess with your mouth, believe in your heart, you will be saved. Atonement is about price. Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin, the price of sin is death. But the gift of God is is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Somebody say hallelujah. The price has been paid. For Isaiah, in that picture pointing forward, for each one of us, his relationship with his creator is restored. He is at one, atoned, at one. The blood of the sacrifice brings that at one moment. Out of the free grace of God, his guilt is covered. The immediate effect of this atonement is reconciliation. If you like, the one who, first of all, is high and exalted, above all, comes close and speaks. Close enough for Isaiah to hear. Who shall I send? Who will go for us? That's the word that comes. Woe to me, I'm a sinful man. All of my words are corrupt and broken. He says, let me come and touch you. Let me heal, let me restore, let me forgive, let me atone. All of the great truths there that are in that statement from Alec Matea. And then the word comes. You can't believe it. The word comes to each, to Isaiah and to each one of us. Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And Isaiah responds to this incredible revelation, this act of saving grace. Here am I, send me. Here am I, send me. Again, I can't remember if I put it on the the notes, but here's a, a phrase I felt God just laid on my heart. Reconciliation leads to recommissioning. Reconciliation leads to recommissioning. As we receive the glory of God, undeserved, unearned, grace of God, we are commissioned. We are commissioned. There are many lives to be restored. We know that. We're well aware of those that we live among and walk among, work among. Lives to be restored. There's much hope to be revived, particularly in our day, in our time. There's communities to be reached here and around the world. We're part of, we have this name over us, regions beyond. So it begins here with our neighbour, but it's from neighbours to nations. It's to the ends of the earth. Just been hearing stories just recently, right across the world, God at work. But right here we hear 
of the drop-in. 27 coming. Some of those people uh, don't really know the Lord. They love to come and be here, but they don't know Him as their Lord and Savior. We'd love them to know Him as their Lord and Savior. So we want to be communicating. We want to take those moments. So feel free to come along to, to drop in. There's a whole group of people that Zoe's made connection to there with mums and carers and others. Who, who's going to pick up that now? Who's going to pick that? Who might say, here am I, send me. Justine and others, thank you for all those who are serving in the team with our children. Simon and Hannah will be back on holiday from holiday. Simon's saying, we need to pick up and go forward with our children. There, there are groups to grow. There are, there's much to be done. As we see the glory of God, there's a commissioning that comes to us. Can I invite you to stand? <coughs> I'd love us in a minute, perhaps worship team, to sing that song again, Jesus, high above it all. Um, but let, let's just pray. So maybe you could come get yourselves ready. But let's pray. We're about a great vision. Isaiah saw a great vision. We're about a great vision. It was right at the foundation of the church. But it begins with a revelation of the glory of God. We're going to sing about that again in a moment. just want to invite you at the start of this new term, just a moment, take a moment to reset, to come again to the glory of God, to say, there are things that I've allowed my vision, my gaze to be dulled. The ground of my life, has, if you like, has got hardened. I've, I'm just ticking over, marking time. Lord, I pray today that you'd give us a fresh vision of your glory. Even as we look at all this pomp and ceremonies, we look at that great crown and other crowns and things that, Lord, nothing compares to your glory. Forgive us, Lord. Forgive us where we've allowed other things to take your place. Forgive us, Lord, where we've dampened down or just boxed you up and said, well, that's how you'll work, that's how you are, just there on the shelf. Lord, we pray that in these days, we would open our hearts again. And let your spirit run riot. Pray for freedom in your people. Pray for liberty. Lord, you know the words of our mouth and how they flow from our hearts. Lord, you know where our hearts are at. Again, freshly today, we bring our hearts to you. We thank you for the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for that great atoning sacrifice paying the price. We come again. Maybe there's someone here, even for the first time, you would say, I've never said yes to Jesus Christ. I've never acknowledged my sin like Isaiah. I've never said, I'm a sinful woman. I'm a sinful man. Forgive me. Come and touch me with your cleansing life. I receive your lordship. Forgive me for my sin. Today, I just want to invite you, even as we sing, that you, you would do that, even for the first time. Come to the Lord. See His glory. Know that there is a hope and an assurance that goes beyond the grave. The very one that our Queen spoke of. As Joyce said to me last week, she, she's now seeing the King of Kings. Lord, Speak to us. Help us to surrender ourselves to you. It's a big vision you've placed before us. There's much that you've called us to as a, as a church, as many churches, similar vision. We ask for your help. We ask for your strength. Lord, we pray for the right person to pick up Noah's Ark. Lord, we pray for others to get alongside the guys that drop in. Lord, we we, we thank you for our children. We thank you for the contacts and connections. Lord, we, we pray for bridges as it looks to restart again in, in October. Lord, we pray for more groups to spring up so that we can grow as disciples and that we can make new disciples by your Spirit. By your Spirit. 
Just let the Lord, even as we sing, recommission you. Recommission you. Let's sing this great song together. Let's respond as we sing.